if we look at verses two and three, it basically says that it's 11 days journey from Horeb by way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. And then in the very next verse, I love the way the King James says it. it and the King James says, and it came to pass in the 40th year. I just think that's hysterical how it's written together. It's 11 days journey. And in the 40th year, and it's like, it, I don't know, it always cracks me up the way, the way that, is, uh, that is written. But isn't that just like life? I mean, isn't that, just like, isn't that just like us? Have you ever said, hey, honey, I'm running to town. I'll be, I'll be 20 minutes. And three hours later, you text going, okay, I'm finally heading home. <laughs> you know what I mean? Those kinds of things. Or you ever, you ever try to do something around your house and go, well, like, it's a 30-minute project, you know, and the next day, you got to come back and finish it. It just seems like that's how life is. Um, I know when you're building or, or me remodeling or do any of that kind of stuff, they say take your budget and the estimated time and, like, triple it because that's realistically what it's, you know, that's a realistic expectation. And I just think that's really funny. There's something else that I found in here, and uh, I'm going to try to get through it pretty quickly. But we've talked the last few weeks mentioning and talking about what is good and what is evil, right? Remember? We, we talked about the fact that we think of evil on the extremes. We think of mass homicide. We think of, uh, you know, terrorism. We think of uh, all those things as evil. We think of the extremes of evil. But in true biblical definition, evil is anything that is a breaking of a commandment. So stuffing your mouth with pig fat is evil as far as God's concerned. Uh, you know, breaking the Shabbat is evil. Not recognizing the Shabbat is evil. The, the feast days, all, all these things um, are, are considered evil by God. And so the question then becomes, who, who gets to define good, what good is? I mean, in our cultural landscape today, just, just think about all the different issues that we're dealing with, all the different things. And this is not an attack on any person. It's just to illustrate. But there's, for the first time ever, a Miss Universe contestant that is a trans, trans whatever. I don't even know what to call him. It's a man that believes she's a woman that is there are colleges and, and now even high schools throughout the country where men, boys, who believe they're women are winning track events. They're winning all these sporting swimming events, all these different kinds of things. And just think about where we are in history, in our country. Not, not, not the whole world maybe is like this, but where we are. And you really have to beg the question, is there a constant is there a, a, a plumb line? Is there an absolute? And who gets to define what that is? Because in our culture, there's two things basically that are, that are, that are, are said is that there are no absolutes. So truth is relative. And I get to call whatever I think is good, good or bad, bad. Even disconnected from any kind of fact or reality whatsoever. It doesn't matter what the facts or the statistics or the reports say, how I feel about something or what I think about something just is what it is. And so I, I was listening to a, a, a Parsha uh, podcast from Aleph Beta this week, and it's, ec it's an excellent one. Did you listen to this one this week? Oh, good, because it's, it's so good. You've got to go back and listen to it. And they brought out something that was like, this is what I've been looking for. This is one of the ties together that I've been looking for. So, of course, in the first part of Devarim, we have that uh, Moshe is retelling about the selection of the elders. And then he goes on and he is talking about um, the spies. And there are some really interesting clues here about what did the spies do wrong first of all did anybody ever wonder why God said I'm going to give you this land it's, it's for you I'm giving it to you I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of all the stuff it's all just I'm going to take care of all the details you just go in and possess it anybody ever wonder why they, had, they sent spies in 
Why were there spies if God already had given it to them? Why, doesn't that seem like a doubtful thing on Moses' part? Doesn't that seem like Moses may have stumbled in his faith a little bit, you know, to go, well, like, I know God said this, but just in case, let's send in a, you know, like a, 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 so let's look at kind of some things that I think are very, very interesting. So let's go back to Deuteronomy 1, Deuteronomy 1, um, well, actually, no. Let's go to Numbers 13. To understand what we're going to talk about in Deuteronomy, we've got to go back to the initial account, which is in Numbers uh, 13. So let's go back there, and we'll read uh, the account of the spies. And um, you'll have to turn. I don't know if I have these on the... I don't, I don't think I put them in the computer, so you'll have to do it old school. All right, so verse 17, and talking to Moses, and Moshe, and he sent them to explore the land of Canaan, and he said to them, now let's take a look at what he said. Go through the Negev, the south, and go up into the hill country of the Har, the mountains, and see what the land is like and the people living there, whether they be strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land are they living? In what kind of land? Is it good or bad? Also, what about the cities which they are living? Are they unwalled or do they have fortifications? How is the soil, fertile or poor? Are there any trees on it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. All right, so let's kind of, sorry, I'm getting all big in the camera here for a second. Let's, let's do this. Let's make a kind of a bullet list. I know some of you appreciate bullets or lists. So let's, let's do this. So let's look at the things that Moses commanded the, peop- the, the spies to do. And let's make a list, okay? So he tells them to go, go into the land, south through the Negev, up to the mountains, okay? And then once you get there, what did he ask them specifically to come back and report on? What's the first thing in verse 18? See, okay, so see the land and see how is it, okay? What, what are we looking at, Okay. And then what, so then what's right under that? What's the first thing under that he asks about? The people, okay? And he gives them a dichotomy. He gives them two, two conditions. What, what are they? Strong or weak, okay? So first thing I want you to do is look at the people and tell me are they strong or weak, okay? Well, what's the second thing he, he asked them to look at? What? Few or many, okay, let's see, that's, that's in verse, um, yeah, few or many. We'll put that one right under here. Few or many, all right. Then what's the next thing he wants to look at? The land, okay. So, so first, check out the people. Number two, check out the land. Now, what does he ask him about the land? Is it good or bad? Okay, all right. What's the next thing? The cities, right? What about the cities? Are they open or are they fortified? Are they encampments? They're just little temporary huts or are they fortified with with walls? So we'll say open or fortified. And uh, what's the the next thing? Back to, the, back to the land, right? Soil or, or back to the land. We'll, we'll keep it kind of as land. And what does he want to know? Fertile or late, fat or lean, some of the, some of the translations say. Well, is it fat or lean? And then he says something really interesting. Now, in, in most translations that I looked at, he asks about two more things. What, what is the first, the, the second to last thing? Trees. Now, does everybody in your scripture, the scripture you're reading, does it have trees? Forests? Okay. Wood? Okay. What's interesting is in the Hebrew, the Hebrew word is etz, which is not plural. The Hebrew word for tree is etz, one tree. Maybe the English translation is right, and he meant trees, wood, forest, in other words, for building and and for those kinds of things. 
But when you look at the Hebrew, it is etz, which is really interesting, a tree. So if we read this again, and he says, how is the soil? Is there a tree in it or not? We'll play with that idea in a second, okay? And so he's looking for tree or trees. And six is what? Bring back fruit, right? All right, so this is kind of the bullet list of what Moshe asks for. Now, let's go down a few verses to verse 27. And we're going to talk about their account. And we're going to compare their account to what he asked. Okay? Verse 27, it says that they gave their account to him and they said, We went into the land where you sent us. Indeed, it is flowing with milk and honey. So what does that speak to? I would say the fatness or the leanness, it's productive, right? Okay, so we, we got this one. Oh. So let's say, we, okay, so they reported on that, and here's some of its fruit, okay? You with me? All right, uh, except the people living in the land are powerful, okay? So we got this one, and what else do they say? The cities are fortified, got that one, okay? Um, what else do do they say? The sons of Anak, okay, are powerful. Uh, and I know that the Hebrew makes mention or that there are that there are many, okay. A lot of people, fortified cities. The land is flowing with milk and honey. The fruit is there, okay. So what are we missing? We're missing trees, or trees, and we're missing good what is what's the big deal what's the the big problem with that well let's look he asked two things specifically about the land is the land fat or lean and is the land good or bad specifically and from the spies report they were pretty specific. They kind of went off the, like they had, you know, in their notes app, and they kind of went like, okay, did we check that? We got that, we got that, we got that. But they didn't say anything about it being good specifically is what I want to, I want to kind of, kind of hammer on. Let's go to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Now, this is the first time that Moshe hears about the land, right? This is the first time that Moshe hears about the land. And who is telling him about the land? Who is Moshe speaking to here? The burning bush. He's speaking to Hashem. Wake up. This is the first time he hears about the land. This is Hashem's perspective on the land, okay? Okay? In Exodus 3 at the burning bush, we have Hashem's perspective. In Numbers, and then later retold in Deuteronomy, we have man's perspective. All right? This is what Hashem says about the land. Verse 8. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up out of that land, the land of Egypt, into a good land and large, expansive a land flowing with milk and honey into the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Amor- Amorites, excuse me, Perizzites, Hivites, and Yebusites. So what is God's perspective of the land? It's good. It's, it's fundamental condition is that it's good. Yes, it's large and expansive. Yes, it's flowing with milk and honey. But fundamentally, the land is tov. Okay, it is Eretz Tov. It is a good land. That is how the land is described, Eretz Tov or Tovah, depending on how what tense it's going to be in. All right, Eretz Tovah, the good land. Now let's jump back to Numbers chapter fourteen. 
This is again the initial, um, the initial encounter with the spies, the initial story, the narrative. This is continuing numbers 13, uh, from Numbers 13 in their, the spies' response. Okay, so verse one, it says, all through the night, the entire community raised up their voices and the people wept. Remember, the spy says, we can't do it. It's, you know, no go. And the people are furious. Their, their hearts are, have melted. And uh, all of B'nai Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole community said, if we had only died in Egypt, if we had only died in the wilderness, does anybody have anything different there? No, is that what everybody, pretty much everybody says? Died in Egypt, okay. Again, I will go back to the, the Hebrew. And what's interesting in the Hebrew is that there's one word in there that none of our English translations have. Can you guess what that one word might be when it's referring to Egypt? The people are referring to Egypt and they said, would it not have been Good for us to die in Egypt. So what is happening is that in Exodus 3, God tells Moshe, I'm going to give you this promised land. It is a good land. That's his definition. Moshe then sets these spies up and goes and says go see the land they come back the one thing they do not call the land is Tov but they do call something else Tov which is what? Egypt it would be good for us had we died in Egypt is the way the Hebrew reads Moses then and Aaron then fall on their faces when the people say, let's set up a leader in verse five to go back to that place. It's fascinating how they call the land of Egypt good and refuse to call the promised land good when Moshe was speaking to, uh, to Hashem in the burning bush. He's the one who said, I'm gonna take you out of that land and bring you to a good land. The implication is that land's bad. I'm gonna take you to the good one. But the people said, by implication, this land is not good. What God has called good is not good. We wanna go back to what we think is good, what we feel is good. Now, Moses and Aaron fall on their face, but there are two other leaders, arising leaders beside Moshe and Aaron. Who are they? Joshua and Caleb let's see what's their response look in verse 6 and 7 Yehoshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Yephunneh who were among these who had explored the land tore their clothes they said to the whole assembly of B'nai Israel the land through which we passed is an exceptionally good land in the Hebrew it is um, Tov Meod, meod, which means very, very good. Now, if you were reading this for the first time, you would expect Caleb and Joshua to go, No, guys, come on, get it together. We can do this. God said it, let's go do it. God is, is powerful enough to take care of, of all the stuff that, that these other guys saw. And they did say that a few verses ago. But they come back and they change their argument. Their argument is not, come, it's not a war cry. After Moshe and Aaron tear their clothes, after the people call Egypt, Mitzrayim, good, Joshua, Yehoshua, and Caleb come back and they say, not anything militarily, they say it's very, very good. So what are they doing? They are supplying the missing piece that the spies left out. Let's, very, very good may not mean a whole lot to you, but let's just take the phrase, very good. Can you think of another time where that phrase occurs? Oh, better sheet, right? What happened in better sheet? What do we have in better sheet? What is that? That's 
creation. That's Gan Eden. That's the Garden of Eden, right? So think about all the good that was spoken about in creation. All six days, all five days really were created. The sixth day, man was created, and God said it was what? Very good, right? Let's think about some other parallels between this and Bereshit. So we have the good, okay? We have very good. We have Moses asks about a tree, and if you read it as a singular, it kind of makes you scratch your head. When Moses said, see if there is a tree, do you think maybe Moses might have been thinking this was the Garden of Eden part two, take two? Where was Eden? Where was Eden? It wasn't in the Everglades in Florida. I mean, it wasn't in Hong Kong. Where was Eden? So we have a tree. We have this thing about very good. We also have fruit. The tree is called good and evil. See these, connect, these connections that start, start to happen? Now, what happened in the garden with the tree? God said, the tree of life you can eat from, its, its fruit is good for you to eat. What did Chava say? When she, and you can go back and read this. When she saw that the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was good for food she ate. Here's the, ba- the, the big question. Who is the arbiter of what is good? Who gets to define what is good? Here's the point. Every time Hashem said something is good and somebody else said they saw something that was good, it was never a good outcome. The, er- the outcome was never good. Lo, lo tov. There's a phrase you can use. Lo tov. Not good. Ooh, that handwriting is low tov. My word. Low tov. So think about what you have. You have this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and there is a fruit there. Same picture that we have in this accounting. This is why scholars are, many scholars that you read, biblical scholars and historians, are leaning more towards the idea that the Garden of Eden story is not a literal creation story. Now, I don't want to mess you all up and blow your, blow your, your mind or anything. I don't want to, you know, cause you to hiccup. But the, the Genesis 1 and 2 can be read literally although there's some questions that it leaves about creation because the Bible is not a science book. But many scholars believe that the story of Adam and Eve and the creation is an allegory to represent Israel's journey in and around the land. Can you kind of see how they get that? What is... The land, the land is Gan Eden. It's the perfect. It's it's where God will establish His kingdom again, where there will be a, a there will be perfection once again when everything is restored. Let's go back and I'll kind of flesh this out a little bit more. Let's go back to Numbers uh, fourteen. And we're going to go to verse thirty one. Now the the people had a really serious worry and their worry in verse 31 or in prefacing verse 31 was that their children and their wives would be taken captive that's what they were worried about and in verse 31 Hashem says as for your children whom you said would be like plunder I will bring them in and they will experience the land that you spurned 
So that was his, that was his, his challenge to their, um, to their, their criticism. In other translations, it says the children would know the land. You may have, does anybody have that? That would know the land? Okay, Val, you do. So he says that the children would know the land instead of experience, they would know the land that you despised. That's strong language. So knowing the land. Now, last time I'm gonna ask you to flip. Now let's go back to Deuteronomy 30 because after all, we are talking about Parsha Devarim. To Deuteronomy 1, I'm sorry. Deuteronomy 1. Go all the way down to verse 39. So in Numbers, he says that they would know the land. In Devarim, let's see what he says. Verse 39. Moreover, your little ones, this is a, a, a this is the retelling, whom you said would become plunder, and your children who today have no knowledge of good nor evil, they will enter there. To them I will give it and possess it. So look at what's happening here. In Numbers, he says, Your little ones will know the land. But in Devarim, he says, your little ones who know neither good nor evil. Why the two different phrases? Why the two different ideas? What do these things have to do with each other? They will know the land because they know neither good nor evil. So what is the implication? The implication is that by not saying that the land is good and trusting God's judgment and trusting what he says about it and following through and, and marching in order along with what he says, a sheer knowledge or lack of, lack of knowledge of good allows in a, a, a knowledge of evil, which therefore cannot inherit what God has for us. The same thing plays into back into the garden. What was the, what was the, uh, the punishment in the garden? What, what were the punishments? There was two main punishments. Well, there were more than that. But the two is that one, there would be exile. Adam and Eve were exiled. What happened to this generation that's, that spied out the land? They, it was a type of exile, right? You don't get to go in. What was this, another uh, punishment that was in Eden? Was death, right? Now, did Adam and Eve die immediately? No, it was a progression. Did all of these, this generation die immediately? No, that's why they wandered. One of the reasons they wandered, they had to wait for them to die off as a progression. There are so many parallels between this story having to do with the land, having to do with the fruit. The tree of life has fruit. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil has fruit, right? In all the rest of the scriptures, when the scriptures talk about fruit, it's talking about one of two things. Actual, literal fruit, olives, dates, whatever. What is the other thing fruit represents? Our, what, is that, what is that? Our acts, right? Oh, I'm not gonna write it down our acts so here's something to kind of help you just solidify something you can chew on a little bit later throughout the day and throughout the week if the tree of life is good for food okay and its fruit brings life what could the tree of life be an analogy for looking at it as not only a, like it was a for real tree that you could touch what if it was an allegory for something what would the tree of life represent 
Obedience to what? The Torah. The tree of life, its fruit or its acts, if we eat of those things, it's the tree of life. It will bring life. Because fruit is always talked about in, as, as an acts, works of righteousness, obedience. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil also produces fruit. What is the whole sin of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Well, there's a lot of different opinions. It's been talked about throughout the ages. Let me just propose this. Could the sin of the tree of eating the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're eating the fruit. Could it be that you, that we take, we have the, uh, I think she said in the podcast, the chutzpah. We have the chutzpah to, as the creation to override what God called good and decide for ourselves what is good. Could that be the sin of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Just like the tree of life has fruit which are acts of righteousness, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil also has its fruit. What is its fruit? What is the fruit that it produces? It's not an apple, <laughs> all right? It might have been a pomegranate. We don't know. But I don't, the point is not, there's a reason it doesn't tell us what the fruit was. Because it doesn't matter what the fruit is. Because it may not even be talking about an actual physical fruit that Eve <laughs> ate. It may be talking about the fruit of their actions. Because you see, we have this whole like Disney idea of the Garden of Eden the poisoned apple that's magic and here's a news flash we don't believe in magic so could it possibly be something else could it possibly be that the serpent whatever form you think that is convinced Eve that she had the authority to call something else good besides what the creator called good and she began to exercise her will outside of the bounds of God's instructions is that a massive stretch I don't know call me crazy send me ugly emails whatever I'm just this continuity all through these stories has to mean something now am I saying that God didn't create Adam and Eve no I'm not saying that I'm saying the Torah has a lot of different facets and we can look we're given permission to look at it different ways and to pull different things from it and so reading through this it reinforces what we've talked about that we can call good what we think is good but that doesn't mean it's good anything outside of what God has said this is good for you anything outside of that is evil there's only two options there's not a gradient of like this is good really super duper super califragilistic good and then this is this is a, a little better a little not as good this is okay this is kind of evil there's one there's one of two things and it all comes back to the tree of life is the Torah who is the living function of the Torah is Yeshua Messiah lived it perfectly the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is anything other than that which you have to exercise your own will your own you're the creation trying to define the creator instead of letting the creator trying to define which is why the dietary instructions make so much sense you have to really and people do this you see it I see it you have to really twist yourself into a lot of, and the scriptures into a lot of knots for the dietary instructions not to make sense now am I saying you're going to go to hell for eating a bacon cheeseburger no I'm saying the father the creator created this body and he created all the things that are out there and like any creator he knows how the system is supposed to work and he said these things will be fuel for this body to operate at its optimum 
these other things are not bad, but they're not for that purpose. But then we come along and say, well, the creator doesn't know what he's talking about. We get to call what we want good and not good. Hence, all of the issues that we have. So I would encourage you, it's a quarter to noon, we're, we're going to wrap up soon. I would encourage you to look at some of these links between the Deuteronomy 1 account of the spies, the retelling, the uh, Numbers, Bamidbar 13 and 14 account, and Eden, and the garden. Now I know it's hard because a lot of times the English doesn't say what, and if you don't read Hebrew, it's like, well, how, do, how in the world do I, do I know? But hey, listen, here's a little challenge for you. Go online and look up the spelling, the Hebrew spelling of tov. Okay, it is uh, tet bet. And then pull up, if you don't, you don't have the Hebrew, you can pull it up online, Chabad.org. There's a lot of places that have the Hebrew manuscript. And look for that word. Just look for that, those two little letters, or three little, let's look for them in the text. And it's like a, it's like a, you know, where's Waldo kind of search. You can look for that word. And where you see it, then you can go back to your English and say, okay, this is what the Hebrew says. This word good is over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. So, fascinating isn't that fascinating all right uh, let's do this we've got about 10 15 minutes so let's cover some more passages in our heart of the matter um, series as we kind of move move through this um, we'll go through some of these pretty quick because we've covered a lot of this already uh, last week and so we're in Exodus chapter 9. Exodus chapter 9, Shemot 9. And a lot of scripture to read here, but I'll I'll just kind of try to go through it really quickly. We were talking about the the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, and the hardening of his heart is not God uh, acting like he's a, a, a puppet, a marionette, but it's using circumstance to strengthen his heart in the way it was already leaning in the way it was already destined destined to go um, let's look we're not going to read all of this um, let's start in verse 13 of chapter 9 then Adonai said to Moshe rise up early in the morning stand before Pharaoh and say to him this is what Adonai the God of the Hebrews says let my people go so they may serve me for this time I will send all my plagues to your heart and on your servants and on your people so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth to his heart surely by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth however I let you stand for this reason to show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the earth yet you still exalt yourself over my people by not letting them to go that's the, that's the heart of the matter is self exaltation Again, this goes back to the good and evil we're talking about. I believe that I have the ability to call good from evil. It doesn't matter what God says. I'm going to say what I want. And I'm going to justify it in a way that makes it make sense. And I'll even twist the very word of God to prove my point. To make it feel right. My prerogative. Thank you, Mr. Barber. Verse 18. Behold, tomorrow at this time I will cause it to rain a very severe hailstorm, the likes of which is not incurred of Egypt till the day it was founded until now. Send word, shelter your cattle and all you have in the field for every person or animal found in the field and not brought home. When the hail comes down on them, they will die. Wherever or whoever feared the word of Adonai among the servants of Pharaoh, which is interesting, had his own servants and cattle flee into the houses. But whoever disregarded the word of Adonai left his servants and cattle in the field. Uh, let's go down to verse 33 so Moshe went out from the city away from Pharaoh and stretched out his hands to Adonai then the thunder and hail ceased and rain no longer poured down on the earth but when Pharaoh saw that the rain the hail and the thunder ceased he increased his sin and hardened his heart both he and his servants so Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he did not let B'nai Israel go just as Adonai had said by Moses hand 
Now, as I said last week, we have to be really careful not to let the spirit of laziness cause us to glaze over this repetition. Yes, we know Pharaoh's heart was hardened. We got it, whatever. I got it the third time, fourth time you read it, whatever. But there are cycles in everybody's lives. We're going through kind of one right now where you know that God is trying to deal with you about something. There's, it happens to everybody. It may be one of the last things you think of Oh, well, maybe it's God. Duh. If we'd have thought about that weeks earlier, maybe we could have gotten out of this thing, passed this test, and moved on from this. But we consider God one of the last things, maybe. The question is, are those things that happen, do we have Pharaoh's heart, and do those things strengthen us against God? Or do those things... Or is our heart pliable and movable where we will hear from God? Our self-sovereignty, God said, you have, you have pushed yourself up against my people or over my people. You've promoted yourself continually. Our self-sovereignty has to give way so that we can worship him as he requires. And this is not just the first time coming to God. This is not an old, you know, an old worthless sinner, you know, that's just saved by grace. That's, that's, that's part of the process but that's just where it begins just because we said a prayer and got dunked in a nice comfortable heated baptismal pool in a white robe doesn't mean that our heart issues are all dealt with that's just where it starts oh it gets much worse from there you just thought that sermon convicted you when you were saved? You thought the Holy Spirit was dealing with you about what a wretched mess you were when you were saved? No, 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 baby. Keep walking. Because the Father's going to use life to continue to mold and burn and mold and the fire and the potter's wheel and all those things that we have the point is not to be a cute little allegorical story the point is to tell you hey guys jumping off into this thing and signing on the dotted line saying I commit is just the start When, when your children are six months, one year old, or, or, or is your disciplinary and your teaching, you know, tactics, are they the same as when that child becomes a teenager? No, well, I hope not. Now, I think in society, a lot of people have gone the other way and said, well, you know, at a, at, well, it's a report I read the other day about some, some wacko is, saying that you know studies show um, that uh, we should let babies uh, give us permission to change them and you know to ch like okay whatever so we've gone all the way in the other way in some aspects but you don't expect the same things of a toddler that you do of a teenager I don't know why we think that in Christianity or in our walk with God, we think that the more we walk with God the easier it's supposed to get that goes against all the laws of nature period it's a lot harder how many of you adults have ever looked at a young person and said enjoy it while you can right but yet we think well I've been walking for God for six weeks things ought to be getting easier by now why would we think that because some guy up in front of a room with a microphone said it it's not good enough he's going to continue 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 to work us and those cycles go over and over and over uh, Exodus 10 we'll read the first four verses then Adonai said to Moshe go to Pharaoh because I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants and let me just say this, this is really interesting in the last passage we read we had God said okay look um, I'll, 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 I'll bargain with you a little bit um, I'm going to send this plague but if you move your cattle and your servants in they won't be touched by the plague well a lot of Pharaoh's servants went well I'm taking that deal and they went and did what God said but at the end of that passage um, verse 34 it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart and the heart of his servants and then here in verse 1 of chapter 10 
it says it again go to Pharaoh because I've hardened his heart and the heart of his servants be careful who you're around and how they push the inclination of your heart how do people around you affect the way your heart is already leaning see the way your heart is leaning is up to you that's between you and God so it's our responsibility and priority first that our heart is leaning in the right direction we, we need to be leaning towards the things of Hashem but we can protect against that at another level by watching who we are around if Pharaoh would not have done what Pharaoh did his servants they would have been they would have converted on the spot what caused his servants to because they were going like they said in the, some of the previous passages like hey this is the finger of Elohim we, we can't do it that you can see their trajectory as you go through the story that, that they're going like hey um, we might ought to be on this guy's side like these people have it's legit we ought to do but yet there's this Pharaoh that is causing them to harden their hearts back they're, they're, they're doing this they're vacillating and some people, their language changes depending on who they're around. Their, their mannerisms change depending on who they're around. Their likes and dislikes. You know, people are chameleons to a great degree. Or some people are. It's really hard to find a person who's the same everywhere, whoever they are. And we all like to think that we are. Well, I am who I am. No, you're not. You, we all fluctuate a little bit, and we adapt to kind of whoever we're around for the most part. What's really funny is that when you do find someone who's the same all the time, there's a lot of people that don't like them because they refuse to bend to this group or that group or to placate or to patronize this group or that group or whatever. They're just who they are, and that's offensive because you're supposed to bend to want to be like us so that's an interesting dynamic that's going on verse 2 uh, of chapter 10 and so you may tell your son and your grandson what I have done in Egypt as well as my signs that I did among them so you may know that I am Adonai so Moshe and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him this is what Adonai God of the Hebrews says how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me let my people go so they may serve you or else if you refuse to let my people I will bring locusts in your borders so along with this idea that Pharaoh's servants are hardening their hearts you have a dichotomy between servants. You have Pharaoh's servants. And what was, what was Moses' charge to Pharaoh at the very beginning? Our God has said, let us go so that we may go three days into the wilderness to do what? Worship him. Serve him. So you have Pharaoh's servants playing against the servants of Elohim. And these two dynamics. And you see that the servants of Pharaoh their heart leaned towards him so when his heart hardened their heart hardened already because they're his servants they lean towards him they're going to follow him how many of us are call ourselves the servants of God and yet when God does something our hearts don't lean towards him they lean away from him which should make us question what keeps us from humbling ourselves is it a self-sovereignty issue? Is it that we, re we refuse to humble ourselves so that we can stay on the throne as king of our, our own lives? You know, there's so many things that we question and that we come up with not to have to be obedient. Not, not to have to, you know, not to have to do that. I mean, I, Heather and I laugh about it all the time, but there's so many things as we've you know the last 12 years or so as we've been learning Torah and, and learning different things and, and seeking out different things there's so many times that we've said well I'll never do that like I'll be obedient but that's crazy I'll never have a menorah in my house that's weird <laughs> now we got them coming out of every corner you know there's so many things that we've said you know I'll, I'll never do that there's obedience but that's taking it too far what does God expect to control every aspect of my life uh, yeah that's kind of what you signed up for if you didn't know it that was part of the contract I want to make you Lord but not of everything what does God expect to micromanage every moment of my day uh, yeah you're his servant that's, you're his, you cease to be yours 
get off your own throne and you put him on the throne. That's what the whole idea behind this whole covenant is. That's the whole thing. Oh, well, nobody wants to sign up for a covenant like that. So we change the covenant so that more people will sign up so we can meet our quota. We'll change it to say, you shouldn't want God because God wants you and that's what matters. God, it doesn't matter what you feel about God. He thinks you're the best thing since pockets on a shirt. And if you'll just come to him, he'll make all your dreams come true like a genie. <gasps> Woo! We change the covenant, the terms of the covenant, so that we can get people into a covenant that is faulty and a facade and perverted, and then we wonder why people don't stay fired up. Because you sold them a lie. When they start reading this book, and because you see, God is God of his word, he takes you at your word. When you stand before someone, a pastor, preacher, congregate, well, however it happened for you, and you say, I'm giving my life to God, God goes, okay, here we go. Oh, wait, but I wanted the life that that guy told me about. Oh, no, 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 no. See, that, that's not the way it works. The, the contract is with God, not with a preacher or a pastor or whatever, a personality on TBN or whatever it is. The contract is with Hashem, and he, his terms go. All right, a couple more verses in Exodus 10. Uh, verse 27 to 29. But Adonai hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he was unwilling to let them go. So Pharaoh said to him, Go away from me. Take heed never to see my face again, because on that day you do, you will die. Right, Moses said. You said it. May I never see your face again. This is the ultimate state of hardness, and you can know this in your own life, and it has happened to all of us. It happens to me on a regular basis. The ultimate state of hardness in your heart is when you start to say that areas of your life are off limits. Those are, those are close-handed discussions. Pharaoh said, just get, I, I don't even want to see you. You're not allowed in my face again. You're not allowed in my presence again. You know, we all know that we have faults, and we can kind of joke around about them. You know, like the little, the things that we know that are, yeah, well, I know that's a, that's a fault. But everybody has a couple of things that's really precious to you, and they're off limits to everyone. Why? That's why when a speaker or even a pastor, somebody starts talking about a particular sin, you change the channel. Or you get all huffy about it. Or you get all offended because you've said, like Pharaoh said, get out of my presence in that area. My heart is so hard, my inclination is so hard, and I'm so determined to do that. That's why people, your family gets all flustered about the food stuff, and about Christmas and Easter, and all that other kind of stuff. Because it's, they've said, that's, that's off limits. You can't go there. One of the hardest things to do is to open your chest and to be that vulnerable to say, not only can God go anywhere he wants, but the people that I've entrusted my life to can go anywhere they want. Man, that's a whole nother level of humble. Last year at Sukkot, I watched, I got to witness a, a mikvah and uh, Matt Napier, who, who did the, the, uh, the mikvah uh, uh, kind of officiated the, the mikvah used a really great illustration that I just I love he said traditionally when men would mikvah for those of you that don't know the mikvah is the immersion what we call baptism and when men would mikvah in community they mikvah naked voluntarily so a group, a minion, 10 more, men, whatever, when they go into the mikvah, they go in and they voluntarily disrobe. And this is a sign of ultimate openness and submission to one another. Because one of the great sins of, of, of against scripture is to uncover your brother's nakedness. And so this symbol of mikvahing together is that as a man in community with other men, I voluntarily uncover myself so that you don't have, you don't have to. I'm exposing myself fully and freely as a symbol that there have, I have nothing to hide so that you don't have the temptation to, uh, there's nothing to uncover. I've uncovered everything already. 
Man, that's tough. I don't know of, I don't know of any places where that I've experienced that's the case. We all have to have those little areas where we say, oh, no, 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 nobody's allowed here. And part of that is a self-defense mechanism because you can't trust people. I get it. I, that's, that's the reality. So on both sides, we need to do some work. We need to work on ourselves that we would be more open and, and less self-sovereign or not at all self-sovereign but then we need everybody else you need me and I need you to work on being a person of integrity confess your sins one to another <laughs> yeah right <laughs> that's funny oh wait that's in the scripture oh it, just, it just doesn't happen I mean it happens but not not like it should because there's no integrity, there's no character. How in the world am I going to tell somebody something and then find out later it was all over Facebook? I don't think so. Not happening. I don't want you to be tweeting about my issues. That's another social media platform for those of you that are like, what is tweeting? <laughs> all right, so we finished in 10. I wanted to finish Exodus today, but anyway, we didn't. That's okay. So let's, uh, let's pray to end and uh, we'll say goodbye to those who are watching by live stream. Thank you again for joining. Uh, and if you're joining by live stream and uh, you want a Maksur, a Rosh Hashanah Maksur, she's just shoot us a text or email or whatever and let us know to put you on the list and we will, we will do that. Avinu Malkinu, our Father, our King. Avinu Shabashimayim, our Father in Heaven. We are so in love with you and so grateful for um, all the things that, that we, we've learned today. Thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you for this Shabbat. Father, work on us about our self-sovereignty issues. Work on us about the direction of our heart and the way that our heart is inclined. Let us be people that are open and humble enough to say, I'm, 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 I'm failing in these areas. And Father, let our community be one that is of, of integrity enough that we will not uncover each other no matter what that we will protect, that we will cover, that we will give grace and mercy and patience to those who we know are striving to be more like you. Let us be people that have a soft enough heart that when you are moving in our lives that we can say, thank you, Father. Teach me what you're trying to teach me. Mold me and make me like you. We bless you and we thank you for this Shabbat, for this meal that we are gonna enjoy together. In Yeshua's name, and everyone said, Amen.